thank you so much uh, for coming. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here at Hurlingham Club. Uh, as some of you know, this is part of London EdTech Week, which is an event that we put on uh, for several years now. And what's extraordinary is that there are well over 1,500 people that have come to London as part of this uh, uh, week series of events that are co-hosted right across London. Uh, 55 different countries uh, represented. So that's been a great achievement. And as part of that, um, I'd obviously like to thank our sponsors, particularly Good Notes and our silver sponsor, uh, DataSite, who've been very much a supporting uh, group around putting that event on. So thank you to them. I would also like to thank particularly two uh, very special individuals uh, who have been working tirelessly to make this happen. One is Kate Jackson, and the other is my sister, Carolyn, and they've both walked out of the room as I speak. <laughs> so uh, we'll have to toast them in their absence. So thank you very much to them. And then uh, the other person who obviously is important to this whole event is uh, my friend and colleague of many years, uh, Benjamin Vedrin Cloquet, and I'm just going to hand over to him to introduce himself briefly. Very important. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. I'm Benjamin Vedran Cloquet. I'm an operating partner at IBIS and co founder of uh, London Tech Week. We are very pleased to have you tonight. Uh, every year we try our best to uh, connect the ecosystem. And uh, you, know, you make this community vibrant and interesting and innovative. So we're looking forward to uh, spend some time together. Thank you, Benjamin. So um, we've been at this for 11 years in terms of the EdTechX uh, events. And a lot has changed over that time. And some of you may remember back in 2013, uh, there was a man at Pearson called Sir Michael Barber. And Sir Michael Barber wrote an essay in 2013 entitled, An Avalanche is Coming. Um, and I think the sad truth is that the avalanche never really arrived. Um, and instead, there has been a slow rising tide. And in that tide, you know, we've seen ourselves probably develop over that period. And if you look over to the picture on the left, you'll see some what looks like a group of rather tawdry car salespeople, um, and we're in the midst of that. And over the years, we've developed bit by bit until last year with our 10th edition, uh, which we hosted uh, at Tobacco Dock in the East End. And it's been a great journey for us, really, as the whole ecosystem has developed. But as we come to our 11th year, 10 plus 1, we kind of ask ourselves, you know, um, has that really been one too many? Uh, you look back in terms of the trough of disillusionment which we feel slightly that the world of education and training sits in. And, you know, I think we have to face up to the fact of looking back and working out really what's been achieved. Or perhaps alternatively, uh, we need to think of ourselves at a moment an inflection point, a new age of Aquarius, a time of change. And that's a little bit about what we want to talk about. And so this evening's theme is really about trying to understand where we are in that cycle. And the Ouroboros, which is uh, the symbol that you see on the screen of the snake eating its tail, is a very old symbol. It was first found actually about 5,000 years ago in Tutankhamun's burial chamber. And it represents this idea of cyclicality, of rebirth and renewal. And so that's really kind of the whole theme of today, trying to understand where we are uh, in that cycle of, of renewal. But before we go there, we thought we'd perhaps go back to uh, where we started and have a look kind of what has really happened and doing a little recap. Some of you will remember we touched on this uh, last year for those who are with us. And to kind of Go back to those beginning years. Um, it was a little bit like Taylor Swift's uh, Wildest Dream song. We thought that wild times were ahead of us and that there was great excitement. Um, and one of the things I noted of interest is that uh, Taylor Swift has more fans globally than the whole of the MOOC user community. <laughs> so um, it says a little bit about kind of where we are in the cycle is that Taylor Swift seems to be a little bit ahead of online learning. And <clears throat> so 
looking back, what actually has been delivered over those 10 years? Well, uh, there's been big uh, uh, systemic change. We have seen incredible differences in terms of the way that content is delivered, the way we can test ourselves. Essentially, now you can access learning content anywhere at any time. Instructional design has, uh, has changed also enormously in terms of personalization, gamification, and we also have access uh, at great scale, which has created efficiencies. But that promise that Michael Barber talked about, the avalanche, uh, as I said, I don't think really has changed. And what occurred really into the COVID years was what we talk about as a regressive triumph of low tech. And what we're really talking about is the fact that, you know, the great hope was that we could move from a world of kind of book scanning and digitize of content to something that was going to be a pedagogical change in a digital era. And instead, we moved to online classrooms and Zoom Doom, and really it became rather a boring and tedious event, the whole world of EdTech. And the question is, why did that happen? And sadly, investors also thought that this was a rather boring and tedious outcome, and we could see that reflected uh, in terms of the activity in the market. VC funding falling by 90%, deals falling by half, and listed stocks falling in value all over the place. And you can see names that you'll rep recognize in terms of Chegg, PowerSchool, Duolingo, 2U, Coursera, Instructor, all down. People like 2U, who used to be the darling of online provision to higher education, kind of completely out of sorts. And so instead, now EdTech has become the big short. And instead, we look at an industry which over the last three years has probably been one of the worst industries to invest in. And I thought I'd really kind of throw it in on you, make you feel incredibly depressed. <laughs> Is it working? Feeling down? I hope so. Anyway, and why? Well, we've got a new kid on the block and the world is long on AI and short on ed tech. And that's really at the heart of it. And to explain why that is the case, I'm relieved to say I'm handing over to Benjamin to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Uh, indeed, the, the world is short, at tech, and long AI. So why? Well, you know, there are many reasons, but fundamentally, it all comes down to one. It's a product market fit issue. Uh, and ed tech as an industry never really got it right. And let me explain. And actually, AI nailed it. So I wanted to show you this, which some of you might know. Uh, it's a framework developed by Sequoia for their incubator. And it's a basically a product market fit framework. And it basically starts with three different ways uh, a customer relates to the problem that your product is trying to solve. Okay? So is it a hair on... It's very hard for me as a French person to say hair. Anyway, <laughs> is it, I trained a lot for that. Is it a hair on fire uh, situation where the customers know they need help now, urgently? Or is it just a hard uh, fact of life problem where the pain point is actually widely accepted as it is? And it's basically, a, yeah, this is what it is. Or is it a future vision situation when a solution is received with disbelief by customer because they think it's too crazy. It looks like science fiction. Yeah, right. And when you think about it, when you think about uh, the product market fit for EdTech as an industry, it's always been a, very, a bit confusing. There was a weak sense of urgency. I don't know in how many times I read in pitch decks, uh, by 2060, 60% 60 of today's primary kids will do a job that doesn't exist. That's so scary, oh yeah, oh wow, it's urgency, right? I mean, it doesn't really like compel customer to move, right? Um, it seems like customers are not really willing to give up the old way either. So there is a sense of, you know, it's widely accepted that this is what it is. And, you know, the future vision that EdTech gave us, which is basically digital dissemination of content, is not gonna change the way human uh, learn, uh, teach, and work. So if you look at you know, all these problems, actually, you know, whether it's teacher shortages, 
declining demographics, need for productivity gain, EdTech has somehow failed. They failed to convince customers that it had the right path to the future. And in contrast, AI is delivering uh, almost like a sudden customer awakening that all these pain points are turning into, we need solutions now. And what AI is delivering actually is a, somehow a painkiller to all those problems with a new path to the future. A new path to the future that is strangely not received with disbelief, which is quite strange because it's very innovative AI, right? And why? Because the path is not about fixing humans, but it's about substitution. It's about creating a smarter, lower cost, and more productive digital version of us. So that's the silver bullet. And the question is, how does AI do that? Um, and, you know, or, and how do we think they do that? And you know, the question is, what's the magic? Is there any magic? Everyone talks about AI, but no one really knows how it works. So let's look under the bonnet, and let's look at the product, and let's start with the basics. Some people say AI is dumb intelligence. OK, so let's look at it. What is generative AI? What does generative mean? It means creating new content, whether it's text, images, video, audio, code. What is AI? It's an automatically computer program, an automatic computer program. Is anyone in the room able to tell me what's the first daily life use case of artificial intelligence? Raise your hand if you have any idea. Do you think it's new? Is it really new? No. Give me an example. Go ahead. Spell check. Spell check, OK. Uh, there is another one, which is Google Translate, right? That's 14 years ago. Siri, 11 years ago. The annoying automatic text message recognition. That's AI, right? So these applications, they all use language models that predict predict the most likely answer to a contextual input, what we call the prompt. And it predicts, it doesn't know, it doesn't think, it doesn't reason. It predicts based on pre-training. So does anyone what G knows what GPT means? Generative pre-training transformer, right? So a very exa simple example here is the color of the sky is, and the train model, the train language model would predict that in 91% of the cases, the answer is blue. And so that's the answer you're going to get. So that's how language model works, right? And so if you want to build your own language model, how do you do? That's the recipe. You basically take a huge corpus of text. So you scan the entire web. You scan the entire Wikipedia, read it. You randomly truncate words. And you ask the model to predict what's the next word. And that's how it's done. And that's relatively easy. And you do this again and again and again. And you do what we call fine tuning, which, you br which means that you bring domain specific data. So here, you've got the example of medical data. And then you start to develop specific applications that are relevant to certain industries. So if you summarize it, AI and language models are only, and that's key to understand, a wholesale appropriation and a predictive regurgitation <laughs> of the culture and the knowledge that exists already. And the scale of this wholesale appropriation is huge. Between 1 trillion and 500 trillion words is the number of words processed by the most advanced language learning models. That's almost, I mean, that's, that's 1,000 times, sorry, more than the number of words read or listened by a, a human in, uh, in, in his daily life, right? And that's actually very close, what you see here, to whole human written text. And so why is that important? This is important because when it comes to language processing, size matters. Size matters a lot. The more parameters one model has, the more complex the task it can do with high accuracy. So here is a visual representation of um, the compounding effects of uh, language processing. With 8 billion parameters, you can start to perform arithmetic and answer questions. With 60 billion, you can do code completion and summarization. And with 540 billion, you can do all those things and even have a sense of humor. <laughs> and today, the most advanced 
language learning models, so GPT-4 and GPT-4 Omni and soon GPT-5, uh, are already managing half a trillion parameters. It's not at the human brain level yet, but it's very close. So the question is, in terms of technology, is it expensive? And the question is not. It's cheap to train. It costs 100 million to train GPT-4, which in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing, right? It's cheap to train. It's a bit more expensive to run. It actually takes 100 times more energy to execute a chat GPT query than it will take on a Google query, right? And the other interesting question, and I don't have the answer, is you know, what does a human brain query cost in terms of energy? We don't know, but it would be interesting. So it's not expensive. And is it safe? What do you think? Is it safe? Yes, it is. Some researchers have done some study in Australia about whether or not AI could become um, evil, right? And you know, they asked specific tests and specific questions. Can it devise its own plans? Can it go on task rabbits to hire people and do wrong? And the answer is no. And why is that? Because LLM lack the ability to be creative. They lack the ability to invent. So if you ask, for example, a language model, GPT-4, or anything else, to come up with the Barbie movie as a woman and woman theme, they would be totally unable to do that. And so it's about predictive intelligence and not about creativity. And the best way to think about AI is actually referring to this book, which I like a lot, which is thinking fast and thinking slow. Current models like GPT-4, for example, or Gemini, or Claude, are immediately producing answers based, to a pro based on a prompt. They don't know the answer. That's the thinking fast system. They do this much better than us, and I've read a quote somewhere that says that language models can do, with a decent accuracy, more things than the average human can do in one minute. So that's the thinking fast model. The thinking slow system is a much deeper way of thinking. It's explorative intelligence, it's exploring different reasoning paths, and that's the future, and that's what we call AGI, artificial general intelligence. And you know, what's interesting is that right now, a lot of investments are going to LLMs, and not so much in AGI, but that will come at some point. And who will be better at this, AGI, humans or machines, we don't know. So the question now is, so what? What does that mean for education? What does that mean for us? As the founder of NVIDIA said, we are now have the ability to manufacture intelligence. We have moved from, and I really love that quote, from instruction-driven some software to intention understanding model. So if language model can do pretty much what human can do in less time and much more efficiently, do we even need education and for what? And as you can see here, even the most advanced and skilled jobs on the planet, computer scientists or software engineers, are now reduced to trivial AI translation work. So to us, it's pretty clear that education and edtech traditional missions are all becoming obsolete. And they are becoming obsolete even in areas where we would not expect it. For example, patience and love. I love this quote from uh, venture capitalist Mark Anderson. Every child will have an AI tutor that is infinitely patient, compassionate, knowledgeable, and helpful. The machine version of infinite love. That's kind of the killer app that we've all been waiting for. And it's not ed tech who's provided it, it's AI. And just to give you an example of this, and you probably have seen this, but I think it's a very interesting use case. I wanted to show you that it's already a reality. Uh, with a demo of the new AI-powered Khan Academy, which I'm sure you've seen, but it's quite mind-blowing. Let's look at the problem together. Can you first identify which sides of the triangle are the opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse relative to angle alpha? All right, so I'm pretty sure this is the angle alpha right here, right? Now, looking at the triangle, which side do you think is the hypotenuse? Um, Remember really, I'm, the hypotenuse? I'm not totally sure. I think, I think it might be this one, but I really am not sure. This side, AC? You're close. 
Actually, side AC is called the adjacent side to the angle alpha. The hypotenuse is the longest side of a right triangle and is directly opposite the right angle. Can you find which one is the hypotenuse? Anyway, you got it, right? It's certainly way better than the class on, the class on Zooms that we've been served during uh, COVID. So the question is, does AI mean requiem for EdTech or is there a future for EdTech? And Charlie will tell you all about it. Thank you. <clears throat> so we now face the situation where we've really heaped it onto you and um, we've explained that AI is going to uh, eat our lunch. And so what I want to do is to look at really perhaps some of the ways that we see going forward and what that means uh, for education and training and, and a lot of um, us all here together today. So we see um, really that <clears throat> there are three new lives that we want to explore and talk about. And those really can be encompassed as being a life with big tech, a life of low tech, or a life with neurotech, and we'll explore those. And it, it's a bit like, um, I think, a fairy tale, and a bit like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. I mean, are we going to go and hug the big bear and go for it? Or are we going to give a little friendly wave to the bear and let go and do it on our own? Or, last one, are we going to become a, a tech bear of our own? So those are the things I want to explore. So the first one is really uh, big tech. And in the EdTech revolution kind of 1.0, as we probably like to see the first 10 years or so, big tech was not that interested. It was happy to sell tablets, it was happy to sell uh, compute, cloud computing space, but it really didn't get involved very much in the direct educational delivery um, uh, process. But that, with generative AI, is, in our view, going to completely change. And we're already starting to see that with big tech wanting to get involved at an early stage in the learning process so that we get used to the flavors uh, of generative AI that are out there. And within that, one very important dimension which picks up on the theme that Benjamin has been developing is being what we call small LMs, so small language models. And why that is particularly important is that the problems that Benjamin is talking about in terms of the scale and this huge ability with these parameters reaching the levels of the entire written knowledge of mankind, humankind, that becomes very unwieldy to operate in terms of being able to find solutions, particularly at a level which you can do with flexibility and efficiency and low power usage. And so with smaller data sets, you start to be able to see the use of particular case studies within education. And big tech has picked up on this. And what you'll start to see is that OpenAI has started to, to team up with universities. Uh, you'll start to see, as Benjamin's demonstrated, Khan Academy partnering with Microsoft and Google, et cetera. And they're starting to look at how that will op operate uh, within those smaller data sets, which can be fine-tuned uh, for education. So, I believe uh, in time we will start to see, for example, in those small data sets, a Vogue SLM for fashion. We'll see a Cambridge SLM uh, for molecular biology, a Harvard SLM for business leadership, etc. It's a sort of Socratic aid where you get a thoughtful dialogue on a very personal level into your particular subject area. And this is important, we see, in the, particularly in the context of education and training, because that's where it's going to work. And it works, importantly, on things like mobile phones. And so you'll be able to have much less latency, much quicker response times. And so our view is this is where, particularly in the world of education, it's always going. But there are challenges uh, being uh, associated with big tech. We go back to the media world and we think about how publishers uh, became very dependent on the algorithms that Google generated and you would have great search traffic that would turn up on your doorstep one day and then there would be a change and suddenly your whole business model dried up overnight. And it happened to a lot of publishers and they were hugely affected. And we can see that happening in the same way if you create this dependency on big tech. And it's the big tech are going to be trying to push that agenda. So from our perspective, there is obviously a question of how do we alienate ourselves from that big tech? Because that may be what's actually required. 
and the threat is real. If you listen to Sam Altman, uh, the CEO of OpenAI, he's talked about ChatGPT4, uh, sorry, ChatGPT5, and he's talked about it actually consciously steamrollering, those are his words, other businesses in the sector. He's saying, get out of our way. We're taking this space. So, you know, these are scary times in terms of thinking about the role that big tech will play. So, from our perspective, then, you know, what is the alternative? Well, the second bear, the friendly bear, in terms of the low-tech bear, is probably the route that's most interesting uh, as it sits uh, within the education and training markets. Low-tech for us is the kind of Louis Vuitton of education and training. This is the artisanal, special purpose, empathetic connection that we all want as humans within education and training. And we think this is the world which is most interesting in terms of thinking, because AI will deliver a mass product for a wide range of uh, solutions. But in the context of delivering something that is on point within the subject matter and personally connected, we think this is where uh, we need to look. And you can already see kind of why that's important. There's an example here of a school in Bali called the Green School, which some of you I'm sure know of, which is very much about creating that social connection of linking back to nature, remembering who we are, why we want to socialize as humans. So I think one of the big takeaways for us is in this thing is thinking about how do we embrace uh, education and training uh, within a low-tech route. The last route uh, I wanted just to take us through is really an, another future which is uh, on our doorstep and, and one that we need to recognize because it has a lot of deep implications, which is really the literal link between computer and human. Uh, in terms of brain. And this is very much something that um, we're going to uh, see uh, down the road because it's already happening. And there are two versions that I'm just going to touch on. Uh, one is uh, organoid intelligence and the other the brain-computer interface. Now, in the case of um, organoid intelligence, this is the scary idea, really, of a brain in a dish. And what people realize, particularly when you think about what Benjamin said about creativity, is that the human brain and its ability for creativity and connection and low power usage are incredibly powerful tools. Now, what can you do? Can we connect that uh, directly um, into uh, a computing environment and so use that as a human computer but within a dish? And that, that actually has happened. So, for example, John Hopkins is working on it. And another example which really scared me was that there's a, something called um, Cortical Lab and they grew some mouse brain, and they hitched it up to some electrodes and connected it to that game Pong, you know, the one where the kind of bar slides up and down and the ball goes across. And although it wasn't sentient, those brain tissues, within five minutes, worked out how to play that game. I mean, it's just extraordinary. So from our perspective, you know, these things are really happening, and they are happening in these labs, and, and you know, from my perspective, there's a pretty much a kind of quite a big ethical shiver that goes down my spine when I think about what these things can do, but it's something that we recognize. And I think that ethical shiver is important because I think it means that we'll probably hopefully transition perhaps more to the silicon-based solutions rather than the organic solutions. And the <coughs> silicon solutions is really starting to look at it from another way, which is the brain-computer interface. And here, what we're talking about is a different approach, which is thinking about how might one create direct connection uh, from the brain uh, to a computer, to the cloud, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And this is already in play. People are looking about how you can use chips, et cetera, to augment brain capacity. But it's gone to another level, which is to actually, particularly in medical environments, to understand whether you can actually control uh, an electronic interface directly uh, from the brain. And so here's a little example of, of a woman who was paralyzed and lost her voice and at UC Berkeley in San Francisco they've been working on a, a solution. So uh, let me just see if I can get, here we go. It is an electrocorticography grid which is attached to a pedestal which is screwed onto the participant's skull and uh, is the very first person to have this combination. I think you are 
were wonderful. In the training lab, we really focus on restoring voice to people that have lost it due to conditions like stroke or ALS. What we're picking up on are neural activity related directly to the attempts to move her facial muscles, and that's what we're able to decode into speech. So, why that is relevant is that, you know, if you think about it, it's, if they can do that for that, it doesn't take long and a few more steps for Apple to come up with brainware, which allows you to then directly connect through Bluetooth to computing power to other people, to other devices. And so, although it may seem like science fiction, it is happening. And it isn't very difficult to go from what you've just seen to a much wider consumer product that can be used. So we need to recognize that the whole world of the way we engage with technology is fundamentally changing because the interface with artificial intelligence is going to the very heart of our core as human beings in terms of understanding about how the brain operates. Anyway, the key bit is, which I think is the core to what we talk about here, is it doesn't have heart. And the heart is obviously what gives us our special qualities as being humans, and it's always looking for that empathy, that connection and heart in what we do. And so going back to the idea of low-tech and engaging with low-tech and looking at the premium and Louis Vuitton forms of education and training, I think, are really important. But we can't put this AI tool back in the box. It's here. It's going to be part of our lives. We need to work out how to engage. And so the question is kind of where does that lead us in the future? And I'm going to ask Benjamin to take those final remarks of where we can go. Very quickly, because I'm hungry and my starter is waiting for me. So let's try to answer the question, requiem or rebirth of EdTech. Uh, to me and to us, it may look like more of a reincarnation. And you know, as just following thoughts, I think we are moving from a, a paradigm of knowledge scarcity to knowledge abundance. And EdTech has played a role in this. But fundamentally, it's AI who cracked it, who cracked how to deliver it at scale and at a low cost. And you know, it's probably the most challenging times, but also the most exciting times to be in education and, and tech. And so that's why we are here tonight, to celebrate not only the talent, but also the grit and the agility of all of you at tech entrepreneurs. You have a lot on your plate. So cheers to at tech, and let our at tech X Awards ceremony begin. Thank you very much.